the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. This morning's lections make for a curious announcement of the church new year. Rather than something overtly hopeful, such as a light shone in the darkness, we pro primarily hear loud lamentation about impending and unpredictable doom. From Isaiah, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down so that the mountains would quake at your presence. As when fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, the mountains quaked at your presence. But you were angry and we sinned. Because you hid yourself, we transgressed. You have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity. And from Psalm 80 that we did not hear today, Hear, O shepherd of Israel, leading Joseph like a flock, shine forth at you that are enthroned upon the cherubim. In the presence of Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh, stir up your strength and come to help us. Restore us, O God of hosts. Show the light of your countenance and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angered despite the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have given them bowls of tears to drink. Psalm 80 is a prayer for Judah's deliverance from one of the nation's most fearful enemies of the time. The psalmist weeps over the fall of the Northern Kingdom of Israel in about 722 BCE to the Assyrian Empire. While that same threat now looms for the southern kingdom of Judah. This portion of Isaiah, third Isaiah, was written about 150 years later, most likely by either Jewish exiles in Babylon, or maybe by some of those left behind. For Isaiah, God is controlling these perilous historical events. Isaiah and the psalmist speak in times of national disaster, bitter internal conflict, and great uncertainty. The language they use expresses an understanding that when things are going well between God and the people, God would act powerfully for them with physical manifestation through thunder and earthquake. Think of the stories in Exodus, wherein God allowed the Israelites to pass through the Reed Sea while the army of Pharaoh was swallowed up. Recall how God led them along the wilderness as a pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night. When God was present in their story, there was no doubt. In the absence of any great events to rescue them from the political turmoil, they conclude God is hidden from them and is using Judah's enemies to punish them for their failures. They throw difficult questions at God. Where are you, O God? Heart-wrenching questions. We are suffering, O God. Why don't you come to help us? Anyone who has experienced loss or illness, grief and confusion, whatever it may be, may well have wondered the same. Where are you, O God? Indeed, some may be praying for dramatic divine intervention as we endure our own times of pandemic, national turmoil, and uncertainty about what lies ahead. Some will surely wonder if Mark's Jesus was alluding to the just only to the destruction of the second temple when he spoke of apocalypse. There is no easy or comfortable answer to the problem of human suffering and never any quick resolution. Yet in the midst of genuine suffering that demands our acknowledgement, Advent comes again. 
quietly but firmly insisting that God is not distant or hiding. In that first advent toward the end of the first century BCE, with Judah and the Jewish people of Palestine again in circumstances like those of Isaiah and the Psalmist, God ventured something new and really risky. God answered, where are you, O God, with, right here, with you. Through the person of Jesus, God came not to condemn the world, but to save it, inviting people of no social importance, a young Jewish woman and the man to whom she was engaged to help bring divine love into the world. In a world conditioned by violence and force, making the presence of God known through the power of love and the value of human dignity was not, is not the task of one lifetime. The work continues with us and our advent, this advent, is an opportunity to reflect on how, how we carry it on. We know that it involves following Christ and imitating Christ, following Christ and imitating Christ. We might spend a lifetime discussing what those two instructions mean today, but for this moment, there are two aspects of following and imitating I want us to consider. The first is that to follow Jesus includes some degree of literal following. Jesus didn't set up shop in Nazareth or plant himself at the temple in Jerusalem or list a location in hours you could come for help. Christ didn't come to sit still or stay put, but to move among people. Some portion of our time needs to be spent trying to catch up with Christ out in the world. Not all of us can do that, but surely some of us can. And I'm pretty certain that some already do. And we need to invite them to share what they're seeing and experiencing, where they are finding Christ. And what about imitating Christ? Well, sometimes that's pretty straightforward. Jesus urged compassionate response to people's needs. You have only to recall the parable of the sheep and goats to understand how important it is in the life of the church. When called for, Jesus himself fed people, but he did much more. He built relationships wherever he went. We need to do the same. Sometimes focusing on meeting immediate needs can keep us from taking the next vital steps. Learning about the lives of people to whom we give things beyond the few minutes it takes for the exchange. We need to make time and space for meaningful interactions, to build trust and respect, to risk making mistakes, to forgive, and to try again. And for most well-meaning people, that is a huge step. I don't know about you, but I was taught ever so subtly that circumstances such as poverty were to be avoided, effectively that poor people and impoverished neighborhoods were to be avoided, as if poverty were contagious or perhaps because my grandparents had all experienced poverty, they worked their ways away from it, never looking back. In case, like Lot's wife, they turned to pillars of assault. I want to share three examples that highlight for me both the pain resulting from neglecting relationship and the profound blessing that comes when we boldly follow and imitate Christ. The first comes from journalist Barbara Ehrenreich's 2001 book, Nickel and Dimed, on not getting by in America. The book describes her investigation into the effects 
of late 1990s welfare reform legislation and on low wage working people, the working poor as they're called. It's the report of a middle class professional's discovery that people working for low wages are forced to play life by special rules designed just for them that hinder their efforts for a better life, work to crush their spirits and deny their human dignity. Frequently, those who haven't had such experiences imagine what life on low wages is like. From the comfort of an armchair in one's own home or an office, it's pretty easy to tell someone else why they aren't getting ahead. The real people behind labels like working poor remain almost invisible. And life has only gotten more pro problematic since 2001. I hardly have to tell you, housing has shrunk as neighborhoods have gentrified. The stock market may look wonderful and rosy, but for the working poor who have no access to the stock market, their wages have actually declined. I was struck by two articles in the Washington Post during the pandemic relating experiences of grocery and convenience store clerks. One published in about May and the second published later in summer. In the first, a grocery store employee told how shoppers were suddenly calling her a hero and thanking her for her work. She wondered aloud to the reporter where these people had been all the years before when they either ignored her or were downright rude. In the later article, a convenience store clerk noted that once the supply chain had been reconnected and some of the initial anxiety around COVID-19 had eased, people had fallen back into their habit of ignoring her or directing their ire at her when the store didn't have something they wanted. Will these women, will these other frontline workers believe us when we say that God is with us? Sometimes rather than being blind to people, we avoid looking at other people's pain. In his 1998 book, Father David Rhodes wrote, in Advent Adventure, how he embarked on solidarity with the homeless back when homelessness was first becoming rampant and really apparent. He joined a couple of um, other priests and all their parishioners in camping out on a city street where the homeless had some space on a cold, cold night right before Christmas. Unlike the homeless, parishioners showed up with hot food and drink to make their night in a comfortable tent go more easily. Afterwards, others, the others departed and seemed to go back to normal lives of advocacy and feeding the homeless. But he was left with a hole, gaping, wondering, drawn by Christ, to something deeper and holier, to do more than protest for the homeless, more than visit with them, to pick up and move his whole life, to live among the people who became not homeless, but his neighbors and friends. Friends willing to collect what little they could to ease his fear. He learned to see past their circumstances to their humanity and to relate to Christ in them. In his introduction, he describes his journey from an insecure childhood of a widowed father who together too frequently spent rainy nights themselves on city streets, to financially secure but unfulfilled adult, to Anglican priest in secure parish ministry. He writes, then a few years ago, it all changed again. When I left the security of parish ministry to work alongside homeless people in the city, <clears throat> it seemed like a return to the dark years of my childhood. 
<clears throat> being with people whose own lives were often a nightmare felt a bit too close for comfort. But I took a deep breath and stepped out boldly and fell flat on my face. And instead of taking the gospel to the poor, as I fondly imagined, I found the homeless people I encountered were bringing the gospel to me. Whether or not I was sharing the love of God with them, they were certainly sharing it with me. How's that for a challenge? If there's any doubt that God was with them, I think he answered. And really it was the people he shared in life who answered it for him. And finally, in Professor Amani Perry's very recent book, Breathe, A Letter to My Sons. In this case, it is not a matter of seeing past circumstances to anyone's humanity at all, but seeing the fullness of humanity, embracing the rich, beautiful diversity of Christ. In her opening chapter, she quotes a line she has heard, and she describes it as coming from everybody and their mother and father too. The line is, it must be terrifying to raise a black boy in America. She responds, between me and these others who utter the sentence, the indelicate assertion hangs midair. Without hesitation, they speculate as if it is a statement of fact. I look into their wide eyes, I see them hungry for my suffering or crude with sympathy or grateful they are not in such a circumstance. Sometimes they are even curious. It makes my blood boil, my mind furnace hot. I seldom answer a word. I am indignant at their pitying eyes. I do not want to be their emotional spectacle. I want them to admit that you are people Black boys, people, no matter how many say so, my sons, you are not a problem. Mothering you is not a problem. It is a gift, a vast one, a breathtaking one, beautiful. How is that for an expression of God's presence with us? This Advent, when so many of the normal seasonal distractions are not available, when it's so much easier to see through the shallowness and self-interest of advertising, when many can't put food on the table or pay their rent, when more than 266,000 Americans have died just from COVID-19, and so many of our friends and neighbors are struggling, this advent, we do have time, time to read and watch, listen, learn and reflect, even if we can't physically get out into the community. We can get hold of challenging books and articles. We can watch TED Talks and so much else. We can consider who we do not see, who we avoid trying to see because it's so difficult, frightening and golly, we maybe just don't know what to do. And who is it that we see through a very narrow lens or the very opaque lens? We can consider how we stretch beyond meeting immediate need, beyond transaction between haves and have nots and toward full meaningful relationship in which each person's gifts and every human being's offerings are valued. How in building relationship, we make tangible and real for one another, for everyone of God's loved human beings and make real the response to that natural pervasive human cry, where are you, O oh God, to right here with you. Amen.